Good morning. I'm Gord Long with the Financial Repression Authority. It's my pleasure to have with us this morning Michael Pento. Michael's a frequent writer on the web, well recognized, and president and founder of Pento Portfolio Strategies. Michael's been with us before. Welcome back, Michael. Thank you for having me back, Gord. How quickly the time goes, and there is lots to talk about, so I'm going to jump right in. Uh, but I do need you to uh, maybe give our viewers just a quick update on or outline on what Pento Strategies is and your background, just in case they haven't listened to your previous interviews. So I manage uh, money for a living. I also provide individuals, institutions, advice through my weekly podcast called the Midweek Reality Check. I've been in the financial media for, uh, I guess, since 2006 when I used to go on Cudlow and Company and warn about the impending global meltdown and real estate crisis. And they usually uh, use me as a pinata, hold me up there and said why I was uh, completely wrong and why all my predictions were not going to come true. So since 2006, seven, eight, nine, all the way through today, I've been predicting that this Keynesian manipulation of interest rates and bending the yield curve inexorably lower was going to fail. And eventually it's going to fail. And I wrote a book about it called The Coming Bond Market Collapse. You know, you just can't take interest rates down to 0% and then into negative territory, constantly increasing the amount of counterfeiting. I call it quantitative counterfeiting because that's what it is. And then hopefully someday this is going to all end well. When? When is it going to end well, Gordon? That's what I want to know. What is going to happen? When one of these central bankers, Mario Draghi or Mr. Kuroda or Janet Yellen, steps up to the microphone in the podium in one of the press conferences and says, guess what, ladies and gentlemen, we have finally achieved our magical, ethereal 2% target rate on inflation. And I, and I believe, by the way, they're going to be successful because when in the history of the world have central bankers not been successful in creating inflation? They're having a lot of trouble this time simply because we're living in a debt disabled world. The private economy doesn't want any more of their debt. They're, they're debt saturated. And so they're constantly taking interest rates lower and lower and lower, lower. And now to the point where if you're going to loan money to somebody, you're going to pay them to do it. I mean, have you ever imagined a world where a government can borrow money? and get paid to do it? But that's where we are now. And why are they doing this? Why, 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 why? It's because in order to keep debt service payments serviceable, in order to make their uh, means meet, ends meet, they have to borrow money at lower and lower and lower rates. And it used to be they were borrowing money at high single digits, then it went down to zero, and now it's negative. 30% of all the world's sovereign debt now has a negative sign in front of it. That's $7 trillion worth. And here's the problem. I know I don't want to get too long-winded, but here, here's the main issue. Let's take Japan. You have negative 0.1% now, an all-time record low on the Japanese 10-year note. You're loaning money to the nation of Japan, an insolvent nation at a quadrillion plus yen in debt, 200 and almost 50% debt to GDP. And you're loaning money to them each and every year, going out 10 years for the deal, the deal, the contract you've signed is that you're gonna lose money each and every year in nominal terms. And then they have an inflation target, the Bank of Japan. So let's just say they meet their inflation target. And this time the whole uh, paradigm of interest rates, the bond market, equity market, the economy has so, so been distorted massively through all these years of negative interest rates and then they're going to achieve their inflation target and then Mr. Kuroda is going to have to step back. He's going to have to back away and announce, well, you know what? Now we have to start being slowly becoming inflation fighters. Well, you're going to have an absolute implosion in that bond market. I mean, you can imagine that yield in one day going from minus whatever it is, 0 0.2, 3, 4, whatever it is at that time, to plus 2% in a matter of days. You talk about carnage and chaos like the world has never seen before. And what I just told you is the truth, and it's inevitable, and it's going to happen. You better be prepared. 
I think the volatility will be just through the roof, up and down, and gyrations because of confusion uh, when that starts to happen, and things break when you get tremendous volatility. But things break when markets have been repressed over and over. What is the market? It's millions and millions of people voting with their pocketbooks as to what the heck price a bond should be and what price a stock could, should be and what a house price should be. And they do that every day. And it's a, it's a mechanism that varies very smoothly when you have all these people voting and telling the market what a price is. Price discovery is, is essential. It's the, it's the nucleus of capitalism. We haven't had price discovery in decades. And it's completely eroded now. What's the price on a bond? What's the price on a stock? What's the price on a real estate investment right now? I can tell you one thing. We don't know, but we do know one thing. It's much lower. Bond prices should be much lower than they are and yields much higher. And stock prices should be much lower than they are right now. And the same for real estate. So we know it's gonna be a collapse because markets have been abrogated and not allowed to function for years. Ever since 1971, the destruction was coming, and now we've seen it so, so warped and, and twisted that you can't recognize any market anymore. There is none, and that's what you said. That's what you meant, uh, not that I read your mind, but that you said it very well. We don't know what prices are, and that's where the chaos is going to come from. No, that's, that's exactly where I was going. When you have sustained malinvestment and you don't price risk properly, I don't believe risk is priced properly, you, are, you end up with lack of price discovery, and that's, that's when things will eventually break no matter what's going on. And, you know, the sustained uh, decrease of interest rates, no matter what we're being told, isn't this really all about just sustainability of the government debt? Exactly. It's, it's not about growth. I mean, it sort of is, but really, that's why interest rates just keep going. And as you said, now they're out of runway. It's because that's the only way they can manage the size of the debt. Am I being too simple? No, you're not being not being too simple at all. It's the only way. See, when you base an economy off of a principle that I have to uh, prevent deleveraging, in order to prevent deleveraging, I have to keep house prices always elevated and home price to income ratios are right back where they were in 2006, 2007, 4.4 to 1. So they don't belong anywhere near there. Uh, when you base your economy's growth not on productivity and a labor force, <laughs> an increase in the amount of people in the labor force, you base it on a wealth effects. You base it on a stock bubble and a real estate bubble and a bond bubble. And when you base the fact that you have uh, 19, 20 trillion in the United States of outstanding debt, publicly traded debt is at 14 trillion, we don't have a tax base anymore in the world to service this debt. So if you don't have a tax base that can service this debt, that means interest rates by definition in the real world, in a market, have to soar. Well, we can't have that. You, you, know, you know what the death knell of an economy is that has uh, 19 trillion in debt and soaring interest rates. Well, it's just, it's just not, it's not functional. So what do you do? You take over the bond market. And then you realize, but wait a second, now that I own the bar mar bond market, I can't get out. You can't get out. And when you can't get out, what do you do? You constantly have to take interest rates lower and lower and lower as the debt keeps piling on. So where's the escape? What look at Draghi had to do. He's not, you know, it wasn't just enough to buy, where I say, counterfeit 60 billion euros a month. That's, that's not enough. We went to 80 billion. And why just buy government debt when you could buy corporate debt? Does this make any sense? Does this make any sense to anybody? Anybody with a thinking brain outside of a Keynesian? Is there a chance here that it's still it's actually leading with low interest rates? The pension plans are in trouble. Insurance annuities are in trouble, and are they they're sort of getting by up? Well, here's the problem. You know, you need eight you need eight nine percent every year to make the public and private pension plans solvent, 8% increase in equity prices. But you've, you've taken the bond portion of these pension plans out the window. I mean, you're, now you're losing money, <laughs> sovereign debt. So now you're really placing all your chips on one side of the table and saying, I need 10% per annum every year in the stock market. And guess what you've gotten so far in the last two years? Zero. That's a huge problem.
So what's the answer? Like I said before, hey, we got to counterfeit more money. We've got to take the interest rates even lower to engender people to borrow more money. Are you kidding me? To engender a more of a stock bubble? You know, I'll tell you, the stock market, if you look at median P.E. ratios, if you look at price to sales, if you look at total market cap to GDP, this market is in the stratosphere. It is so overwhelmingly overvalued and disconnected from fundamentals. But we don't care. As long as we, as long as Mario Draghi and Janet Yellen, who raised rates one time in December and the market fell apart and then said, you know, maybe our dot plot's a little bit uh, optimistic. <laughs> We're shit. Listen, we are stuck with these Keynesian manipulators forever until everything implodes. And I think the trigger, yes, well, when's it going to happen? Whenever they, whenever, and it'll happen, whenever they reach their inflation targets, then they have to make a decision because inflation not, doesn't just go to 2% and then stop. It keeps on going. And central banks can't nail an inflation target on the head. If they get money supply growth booming and it goes to 2%, and then it's going to go to 3, 4, 5. They're going to have to become inflation fighters. And like I said, you watch that. There'll be a week when you see bond yields absolutely unravel. They'll just soar. It'll be a vacuum. Zoom. And you'll see stock prices and economic growth tank in tandem. Michael, could you take us through? We've had a lot of announcements. We've had the Bank of Japan with NERP. Uh, we've had Drahi two weeks ago talking about his his set of announcements and expansion. And then most recently here this week uh, with Janet Yellen. Could you just take us through the three of translating what they were really saying? And is there a, a pattern in here? Well, the pattern is, as I said before, you know, if you base economic growth on perpetually falling interest rates and then you eventually hit zero, well, what do you do? You know, if minus uh, three, uh, 30 basis points isn't enough, well, I guess 0.4% in a deposit rate. That's really going to get banks to lend. So now the banks have their excess reserves parked at their central bank. And now the central bank, instead of paying them to keep their reserves there, they are now charging them to keep their reserves there, and they're charging them more and more of this fee. So why would they do that? So banks can say, oh no, I need now to find somebody who can't pay me back to take out a loan, or I'll just buy more sovereign debt at more and more of a negative yield. I mean, isn't this, you know, it, you know it's like, you know, I don't want to use a trite, uh, banal um, uh, simile, but you know, you have a heroin addict and they used it before, and he's addicted to heroin. Well, you got to keep up the heroin. Well, if you have a, whole, a, a real estate bubble that burst because too many people took out too many loans and, you know, you had people who really didn't have any real income owning five houses, and when that blew up, you say, well, how do we fix that? Well, now we got to charge banks for keeping their money with us so they can make more loans to people that are going to default. And then we're going to, what do we do? Uh, bail out the banking system again? I mean, why? See, this is all about power, hubris, trying to keep people in power. And people in power right now have somehow think, they have the hubris to believe that they have abrogated the business cycle and recessions and, you know, layoffs and problems in the economy. We can take care of everything. It's bread and circuses all over again. That's what's happening now. And I don't know why we become such children in this world that we can't just say, you know what, we've, we made a mistake, we've taken out too much debt, debt has to be pared down, it's going to be a year or two of, of a recession slash depression, and then on the other side of that we can have a real economy. I mean, isn't that what we really want, a real economy? I guess not. I guess we've so, we're become such children that we cannot take a recession anymore. And we've allowed our leaders, elected and unelected, to do this to us. The capitalist system doesn't work unless you have a cleansing at some point of excess debt. Call it a recession. It's a healthy part of, of growth. And it's like a reset. You have to have a floor to start moving up and it always gets overextended. Joseph Schumpeter talked about it. Uh, Hayek talked about it. It's very Austrian. I mean, everybody knows, and this is before the Fed, you have to have this cleansing, cathartic purging of debt Every few years, if you you know if you have so much debt, take it down to a personal you know a personal level or a business level. If you have too much debt that you cannot pay back, 
something has to change. You have to restructure that debt. You don't fix it by artificially taking down interest rates and forcing the business or individual to take on more debt. It's not going to work because you're going to have an adjustable rate mortgage on everybody, on the government and on businesses. And that's when things really implode. So we're not adjusting. We just keep rolling the debt over and over. It gets bigger and bigger. And so a bad hair day or a recession becomes much more serious than, than you can imagine. Collateral collapses and we, we could go on there. But I need to shift gears, Michael. Gold has appears to have broken out, uh, mm -hmm. getting all the signals uh, that it has. Is it telling us something in terms of confidence in the financial system? Well, it, it absolutely is. You know, they used to uh, say the wrap on gold is, well, it doesn't pay any interest. And why not just put, why not just put your money in the bank and earn, you know, or, or buy a, a one year's uh, sovereign note and get paid uh, 5%? And why would I stick my money in gold? Well, now, uh, if you stick your money in a sovereign note or a bank, you get Zippo or even charged for the privilege of doing so. So now it's the reverse. I get charged. I, it costs me money to buy sovereign debt or hold my money in the bank. So now I, I know I'm going to get my principal attenuated in those areas. So now I'm flocking to gold. And interest rates, as they go more and more negative across the globe, is going to force more and more money into gold. Because if you have an ounce of gold, you're going to pull out an ounce of gold. And you don't need there to be inflation for rates to be negative, real interest rates in the real sense, when they already are starting out negative in nominal terms. So that's just why people own gold. And when you realize, like I said before in this interview, that there is no escape and the only escape hatch is a deflationary depression on a global scale, the likes of which we have never before suffered through or can even imagine. And that's why gold is breaking out. Well, it seems to have lined up pretty close when with NERP starting to be more front page, uh, more people talking about it. We're seeing some institutions beginning to nibble uh, at, at gold, which we've never seen seen before. So something is dramatically beginning to change here. Yeah, I, and I would say also that the mining, the gold mining shares, which uh, the ratio between gold miners and gold has really never been lower. So uh, uh, there's your opportunity. They were down 85% in the carnage between 2012 and and December of 2015. Michael, what, what should investors do right now? What, uh, I don't, I'm not looking for recommendation, but strategically, how should they? Well, I manage money. I'll tell you in a, in a broad sense, uh, I have about 20, 25% of my portfolio in mining shares, which is high uh, as far as Wall Street is concerned, but I think it's completely appropriate at this juncture. I'm off, actually now shorting the market too, once again. Um, I, I think uh, the the, the divergence between stock prices and the underlying fundamentals of the economy, which we've had a 2% economy since 2010, that's now falling back to a 1% economy. Uh, if you look at stock prices in relation to earnings, in relation to sales, it's completely uh, uh, without merit. And I believe after this 10, 11% rally that you've seen in February and into to the middle of March here, that's a rally you should be fading. So we'll have gold, you're short the market. And the only place I'm long a little bit here is with energy. I've been long energy for a few months now. It's done spectacular for uh, the investors here at Pento Portfolio Strategies. So that's my hedge against gold and, and short the market. So you want to be long at all, you want to be long in a place that's been beaten down like energy stocks. Pay, pay a nice dividend too, and having a dividend in a world of uh, zerp and nerp is not such a bad idea if you want exposure. So the mining, sh the mining shares are primarily precious metals. Yes, all, only precious metals mining shares. Yeah, only that. I don't have anything else. I don't want. I don't want any base metals right here. Don't forget China. I mean, China right now has more bad loans on their books, about six hundred and forty-five billion, than our entire subprime mortgage market. Circa 2006 it was about 600 billion dollars, and they're bit. I mean, China is a nation which was responsible for almost all of the growth. About 50 percent of all global growth was in China, building a massive fixed asset bubble that's that's being uh, melting down right now. And China is a nation that pegs their currency and their stock market and their bond market to the hundred decimal place. This is the most manipulated economy on the planet. Planet. And there is no smooth transition from an economy that was 55 percent 
investment, their GDP was 55%. There's no smooth transition from a manufacturing economy to a service-based economy. They're not even trying. They, manip they, they admit to manipulating everything in their economy and in their market. Their currency is manipulated, stock prices, bond prices, everything is manipulated. So they're, they're going to have a crash landing in China. There's no growth, long-term growth. I mean, they're, they, they have taken on 28-fold increase in debt since the year 2000. There is, no, there is no natural mechanism for that. That's not private sector debt being borrowed from the savings of an economy. This is People's Bank of China credit and being directed by the government to build unproductive investments. So China is going to collapse. It's not, gonna, it's not sustainable. That's why I'm not at all positive on, on base metals at all. And like I said, the only thing I, I, I have a li I'm not really that positive on energy either, but that's the hedge against being short the market in long gold. And it's working out really well. Yeah, it's been a spectacular investment here in the last six weeks, eight weeks uh, time frame. There's been a lot of people, a lot, a lot of, lost a lot of money in the last year and a half uh, trying to catch the, uh, the rally or catch the bottom on it. Um, but well, go, I'll put it this way. It's all about the dollar. And, and so if I'm wrong, if I, listen, what I think is going to happen is the dollar is going gonna, is, is gonna to stabilize here. It's, it's in a trading range. And I think that oil prices could fall back to $35 uh, a barrel. That's going to bring the market way down. So I'll lose, my, I'll lose a little bit of money on my oil longs, but I'll make money on my shorts. I'm about 20, 25% short the market here. And all that chaos could even put a bid back into gold. Because I don't, you know, gold is going to be a winner no matter what happens, really. I, I don't see a losing scenario for gold. I, I don't. You were on my last question because we're up against our hard line here. Michael, outlook for the U.S. dollar. You said in short term a consolidation here, in immediate term, but more, more a little longer term. Well, yeah, when you ask about the dollar, Gordon, you have to ask me what I think about it intrinsically and what do I think about it against the yen and the euro. So, um, so, the do so as I predicted, I've been on record, uh, December of 2015 said the dollar is going to fall, fall hard. Um, and that was when it was about 9,900 on the DXY. And it did. And the reason why I knew it was going to happen, or I thought it was going to happen, is because I knew the economic data wasn't supportive of four rate hikes. And that's what the dollar was priced in, four rate hikes in the United States, whereas Japan and Europe was in the middle of massive QE and would continue to do so. So when that when that uh, did not pan out, and we, we saw Yellen walk that back herself in uh, it very recently saying, you know, it's not going to be four. It might just be two. I don't think it's going to even be two. It might be zero or one, and it probably is going to be back to QE before all this ends. Um, but so that you see the dollar uh, pull back to about 94 on the DXY, it's going to probably be more range bound because, I mean, how, how much further can the dollar fall against Mario Draghi and Mr. Kuroda who are desperately trying to depreciate their currency? So, I, like I said, I think the dollar stabilizes here. However, however, you don't just ask yourself, what's the dollar going to do against the yen and the euro? Ask yourself, what is the dollar doing intrinsically against gold? And I think all these currencies are going to lose their value vis-a-vis -vis the real money there is out there that has been real money for thousands of years, and that is gold. Do you put silver in that same category? I put it in. I put it loosely in that category because the silver has an industrial component to it. So uh, I favor gold over silver, even though that ratio is gold silver ratio is suggesting silver's under. And see, yeah, uh, people have always tell me, you know, why not silver? Why not silver? Well, a gold that that gold silver ratio is getting uh, you know higher and higher, and I don't think it's going to change anytime soon because of the lack of demand of there is an an economy on the planet that's growing right now. So that industrial component, I mean, I think silver is going higher. It's just not going as high as gold. Michael, any comments or messages you'd like to leave with our uh, our viewers before we wrap? Um, I would say listen to uh, the major financial media with the volume on mute. Look at the uh, economic data. Make up your mind. Tell, ask yourself, what do you think is going to happen in the global economy? which is saturated in debt and cannot grow 
And if you, if you are saturating debt, you cannot grow your economy until you deal with that debt. And you deal with that debt by restructuring it. You lengthen the duration of it, you cut the interest rate on it, or you default on a, on a part of that principal. So that's the real answer here. That's what I'm looking for reality to strike. And I don't see, I don't see anything like that. I see the exact opposite. Central bankers encouraging more and more debt. So whatever, whatever's gonna happen, However bad this is going to be, they're making it worse and worse and worse. So buckle up and uh, stay tuned. By the way, if you want to come to my website, it's pentaport.com. Uh, I have a podcast there. I manage money. I give you great uh, uh, advice on what to do with your money. So um, I look forward to continuing the conversation with your audience.